Hello, welcome to CarCast in Edmonds. I'm Matt, the moderator, DeAndre, here with Alistair Weaver from Edmonds.com. Uh, welcome. Thank you very much. I think it's uh, starting to clear up a little bit uh, outside, and, and which is interesting because we, we complain about a little bit of the weather out here, but most of the rest of the country is just getting demolished with <laughs> cold and snow. And and uh, uh, so we're still spoiled and stuff out here just, I, I was, but uh, we did have a big earthquake did you just feel the earthquake? i just felt it yeah it was uh it was a 4.7 4. 7 in malibu yeah followed up by a little 3.0 aftershock that i didn't even feel but um yeah sitting here in my in my in my warehouse i felt that nice little 4.7 by the way for those of you who don't live in california if that never felt an earthquake before um that is kind of interesting i've been here uh, a couple of times now where someone visits from out of town and there's an earthquake and they're scattering around like like somebody just let a puppy off a leash uh because uh, they don't know what do i do what do i do i go just sit on the couch and do nothing like that's just enjoy the ride that's that's basically what you do <laughs> i think that's the biggest though in six years of living in la i think that's 4.7 i think that's the biggest i've experienced my brother was actually caught up in the yeah, uh, you know the Japanese earthquake that set off the nuclear reactor and everything else. Uh, he was caught up in that, and he was on the thirty seventh floor. So he was hiding under his desk with his office chair, like flying backwards and forwards between the the walls. And they had to evacuate to Hong Kong for six weeks, and all the tropical fish died. And uh, you know, but it was, um, yeah, that was a big deal. But yeah, anyway, we're here. Anyway, the house we're here. Is still but, just and, about and, standing. And you're you were home, so you got to actually feel it. If you were driving, you probably didn't even notice anything. But I was on the first floor, so I was upstairs. So I felt it pretty much upstairs. Yeah. And, well, yeah. there you go. Welcome to grab the California. baby heroically. <laughs> Use it as a shield over your head. No idea what I was going to do with him, but he was there in my arms. <laughs> uh, you know, one of the things I wanted to to talk about is uh, it's not so much on cars specifically, but just how things have changed, I guess, in the automotive journalism world over the last, call it 20 years from before the internet to now. And it just used to be, you would lie, you would rely on these, uh, you know, printed reviews in, in the magazines that we love. And I kind of miss the magazines. I kind of like m missing, you know, actually holding the magazine and, and reading the reviews and and stuff but there's so much that happens kind of behind the scenes to get to that point of the review like how do you get invited to test vehicles or to travel to certain events where vehicles are being debuted <clears throat> and now in this in this world of over information this internet world of over information uh we look at reviews for everyday things you know coffee makers cameras phones you know everything and there's just it's so tough to kind of figure out like what's real what's not real what's sort of manipulated or paid for uh it kind of kind of an interesting kind of an interesting thought how how we can differentiate car reviews from the rest of those things um i guess because they're a little bit bigger and more expensive and not a lot of, uh, not a lot of, you know, manipulating Amazon.com, you know, to figure out what's going to be the best car to buy, you know, as opposed to a, a shelf or a coffee table that you think you like. Uh, but yeah, think back to, I don't know, maybe 20 something years ago before the internet, you know, what you see, I, I, I started, what am I? 46 years old. God, terrifying. I started as a 21 year old, so I was right on the cusp of the internet. I know we talked about his previous show and I was like recalling the career, but I joined Autocar in August 98 and we didn't have email. I'd used email. I remember email, using email at college, but then, and I had a cell phone, which was something, uh, but we didn't have internet. And the, yeah. the publishing house that I worked for uh, was should we say not renowned for investing in talent or, uh, or, or, um, equipment. 
So I had this like really old Mac with like a portrait sc screen, which these days would probably make sense. But back then was also, I think it was black and white or something. Literally used to crash about six times a morning. And then, uh, and, and then, you know, we did a weekly magazine and looking back on it, it was a huge effort because every week we produced a magazine and auto car as a weekly magazine still, still exists. And then after about six months, one day somebody came in and said, Oh, you've now got email. And you've also got this thing called the internet but only the editors got that <laughs> like you little i was like an editorial assistant it's like no you can't have the internet because we yeah. think you'll misuse it you, you spend your whole day looking at like you know baywatch or whatever or, or uh, whatever whatever it um whatever they thought we would what, whatever they thought that we would um we would do with it back in the back in the 1990s and um it was so so we just kind of carried on and we picked up the phone and we talked to people and you had this like little book of contacts and then, you know, this was, I remember then going freelance a couple of years later. And this was like, now the internet is starting to kick in. But nobody wanted to be, nobody wanted to be in the internet because it was all about our being in the magazine and landing on the CEO's desk and reading it on the toilet or reading an old copy in the dentist. So it took a long time for people to kind of wrap their head around the fact that the internet was, was, was actually something worth having. And even now, if you look at, you know, I don't really want to talk about, you know, rivals, but if you look at, you know, today, like Road and Track, Car and Driver, great brands like that, Motor Trend, you know, they've all got magazines. So it's always like, how much do you give away online versus how much do you keep for the magazine? So what does the magazine start to look like? You know, and a lot of publications found this and a lot that I work for found this that, you know, the magazine starts to look like just the internet printed but two months later because i think what people didn't realize and it's still the case for a lot of magazines is the lead times are huge so i used to work for yeah. fhm as a freelancer it was like you were writing stuff that wouldn't come out for three months and like in the car world now that's like almost unthinkable right. and so I mean, oh we... god don't put it don't put it on the internet because if you put it on the internet how are we going to sell a magazine in like three months time but then everybody else has put it on the internet so how well, how do we do this it we was, we go to we go to events and car launches now and we're we don't even we're publishing information before the event is even over. Now it's kind of got ridiculous because it reached the stage and thankfully it's probably throttled back a little bit. But it, but it was like ah the the embargo. You know, a lot of what we do is like everybody agrees that don't publish before this date. And it's like oh well the embargo breaks the moment you get the car. So like everybody sits in the car park. <laughs> I mean, it's got it's almost like gone got got to a ridiculous yeah. level, but. I mean, honestly, life was when I was at What Car for a year, which was like a, similar to Edmunds in some ways in in the UK. And it was actually quite nice because you would go on a foreign launch, and it would be two days. It'd be two day launch, and you'd fly off. They'd fly you off to Spain to drive some latest car, and you know you'd have a few beers, you'd talk to your mates, and you know you'd fly home again. And then about a week later, you'd write three hundred words because that was all there was space for in the magazine. And then you know six weeks later, said magazine would come out and. It was actually quite a nice existence. Now it's like, have you, you know, have you got your Twitter images? Have you got your Instagram images? Have right. you done a video? Have you like, you know, and this is all before you even get back. So it's all got, you know, arguably it's got a bit less fun. And but before the internet, when you guys were doing those things, um, getting getting information about the cars, getting invited to certain some of the events, but but I I just think just maybe just how like press cars or media cars were, were handled, uh, were a little bit differently. Um, uh, yeah, it was just kind of, it was just kind of a different process. The whole thing was, it was a different process. I just got an email today going, here's a new fleet of, of media cars that are available. Let us know if you're interested in any of these things and we'll, we'll try to schedule it. And I, I, I got emails today for probably 40 cars, you know, and, yeah and going well all right well let me think about what's what's new what's different what's i'm expecting a change to see and then and also most of those cars these are press cars that we drive these aren't like the launch of that car which means this car has been announced we've all probably seen it at an event we just haven't gotten seat time in it yet so there's sort of the two phases now before you like you said you pick up the magazine and here's the car you didn't know it was coming out it's a new version of the 911 and here's our review and here's our drive and here's our performance testing all in one shebang because you did it three months ago and then you printed it now it's like 
you fly to an event. We got the images of this is what it is. Maybe we got a couple of quotes from from someone on the manufacturing side, and we're gonna we're gonna test the car, drive the car at some point in the future, and then we're gonna get on that schedule. Uh, but by the time we drive the car, it's like, well, we already know the car is there. So I could go through the list and go, I already know what's changed on the list, right? What something's facelift or more horsepower or revision someplace. Uh so yeah, it's just kind of a, a, a kind of a different process altogether. It, it is. And I remember back, you know, back in back in the early days, you like, you know, there was a point I was actually speaking, he remained nameless, but he's now a very senior figure in the PR industry. And I saw him at the CES show in Vegas at the beginning of January. And the last time we'd seen each other we were on a flight to the Abu Dhabi Grand Prix shortly before I moved to the, the US. And you know, we'd known each other well, but he was off to do a marketing role. I was off to the US and we sort of shook each other by the hand. And he said, we'll probably never meet again. But anyway, he's now a very senior figure in the PR industry, a lovely guy. And we 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 um we 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 sort of met at CES and he said, you know, remember like 20 years ago, we sat in a bar and we said, you know, one day we'll be the old, you know, we'll be the old boys in the corner talking about like the days that were. And he yeah. said, maybe this is the moment where like we start having a coffee in CES. We're both like, you know. Both, you know, resolutely middle aged, uh, and and it was like, oh yeah, you remember when like that happened? And it's, um, I mean, some of the tales of like the early days were some of the behaviour, not so much from, not so much from like the re, you know, the the sort of what I'd call this. I don't know it's Patrick, but the senior press, not from like the big titles, but there was a whole army of the of what we call regional journalists. So what, what every region at that time had a news business in the UK had a newspaper. And basically, it was very soft content. To it's almost like a lot of the influencer stuff today. So it was it was all very sort of positive stuff because you were supporting local dealerships. But it was known as the holiday club. So you had this group of people who would travel around the Europe. And it was all very flashy, nice hotels, beautiful foods, much you know as much booze as you want as you could handle you know in the evening. And they were known as a holiday club because they just went from event to event to event always writing nice things about the cars so the manufacturers loved them and you know some of the some of the behavior like one guy i remember saying to me yeah Al alistair we you know what you got to do is if you if you turn up on on an event wearing jeep gear on a land rover event that means land rover will give you land rover gear <laughs> this was like this was like his strategy yeah that's was people interesting yeah there was people who would like empty, routinely empty the mini bar into their into their suitcase to go, you know, to when they were when they were traveling home. There was a famous story. Apparently, somebody used to bring um, somebody brought his 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 drapes, his curtains, his drapes from from home so he could wash them, you know, get them washed by the hotel. And somebody was using a press car as a as a got caught because he was using a press car as a as a mini cab as a as a as a as a taxi. Because basically it was a free car with free fuel. So if I use it as a taxi, it's just neat profit. <laughs> so it's like stuff yeah. stuff that went on was just to, you know, today it's got a lot more serious. It was pretty mad back then. I guess, I guess, yeah, I, I think it's changed a lot. Well, first of all, we get press cars delivered and fueled up and I always refuel them and with, with, you know, the best fuel I can get, you know, something 91 octane out here and give it back fully fueled up. I, I don't know. I just... From day one, I've always been that way. And if I get a chance, I I prefer to return them clean as well. Like it's been raining here, so there's nothing I could do. He literally picked it up in the rain. So, you know, throwing some soap on it would have made a difference. Um, but yeah, I don't I don't drive it for a week and then just give it back. Like, uh, you know, with with grass and dirt and crap in the on the floor mats, like I, 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 I give it a little clean and top off the fuel tank before I return it for sure. There was one of the guy that I remember had. You remember MG Rover, which was the famous British brand, it's now reborn as a Chinese brand. Went bust, and they went bust basically overnight. And I know somebody who had a press car, so he had a media car sitting on his driveway. And then he was like, "So what happens? What happens now? You know, and it, it's like yeah. the press office is gone. <laughs> the phone line doesn't work. There's nobody to call." So I think it was like six months before the administrators caught up with him and said, like, that asset that's sitting on your drive, that, that $60,000 asset, I think that's probably ours. And yeah. he was like, I got no idea what to do with this thing. Is right. it insured? Can I drive it? Is it like, you know, it, it, there's some crazy, um, crazy stories. But now it's got, 
you know, now I think particularly after 2008, it, you know, the industry got a lot more serious because also the media world has changed so much that a lot of like the regional press that I talked about, and that wasn't just a UK thing. It was a American thing as well. You know, that's a lot of that has gone away. Uh, you know, you've had a rise both of the internet and then more latterly of, you know, like influencers where people are going out and like building a brand on their, on their own and some of them doing it, you know, spectacularly successfully. Uh, but it's also kind of brought then a different kind of approach. And, you know, there are some influencers who go out and really, you know, do have an opinion on a vehicle and a, and a valid opinion, but there's also an awful lot of people who are, you know, being paid to say certain things, shall we say, along the journey and, you know, not really doing a, you know, a thorough assessment because that's not what their audience wants. So trying to trying to cut through the noise has become more and more difficult as the years have gone on. And you mentioned like buying a coffee machine. I'm looking to buy a, want to buy an espresso maker and trying to find like a, a real review online is so difficult, especially if you work in the media world and you can kind of like go, ah, okay, that's, you know, you sort of join the dots. Yeah. It's really hard for almost any consumer product now to really know what you're looking at. And I think that's a, and I know there's a lot of fuss about politics as well and the influence it's going to have in the election, but that's a tough place. I think that's a really hard place for the consumer to be. And, you know, I end up looking at Amazon and saying, well, if it's got 5,000 reviews, maybe that's a quorum and what does that mean? And it's it's just hard to cut through the noise and, you know, find out real information now. Yeah, because it's, so much of it is just kind of copy and paste, like uh, these affiliate programs where like, oh, I don't ever need to even own a coffee machine or espresso maker, but I can write a blog uh, evaluating the top 10 and all linked to Amazon. And if you like it and you click to it, I get a couple cents from Amazon and my affiliate program, but there's no real review there. All I did was compare maybe features of items that I've never seen before in my life. I think the automotive space um, still can be a little different than that. I, 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 I think there is definitely a lot of copy and paste. And look, we, we've seen it before. Like I, I'll do a podcast with you. I'll do a podcast with Goldberg. You know, Goldberg will say something about uh, the, the halftime show uh, uh, for the Super Bowl or, or whatever. And then it'll, in a day, TMZ will pick it up and it'll be all over. And um, nobody listened to the podcast. Nobody got any reference to anything. They just saw somebody say something and they just copy and paste it again and again and again and every every gossip mag or or wrestling forum just ran with you know a little piece of information but if you look at all of them they're all exactly the same there's not even like they didn't even change the adjectives or, or <laughs> like like they didn't try to spice it up a little like it's all pretty much the same uh because nobody and then you go and you go oh this is we're getting a lot of buzz people are really happy or mad about something that we said and then you get your download numbers and go it's it's unchanged it's exactly the same because nobody listened that that yeah. audience it's still still huge though matt still still enormous yeah, numbers. I, yeah yeah i mean there's still great numbers oh, i'm not worried about that but <laughs> it didn't but every everybody at tmz did not listen to the podcast they just ran with what you know rumor that they heard so um it, i it, i think being in the automotive space, there is the relationship in, in the journalism space or or now that's expanded, like we've said, to YouTubers and influencers and stuff, uh, how that sort of expanded and get access to vehicles and be able to test the vehicles um, is is kind of interesting. I think that's also the difference in the automotive space is, I mean, if you go to something like TripAdvisor, I probably believe that people writing a review or leaving comments on a four-star hotel have probably stayed in a whole range of four-star hotels. So have some reference point, you know, common sense probably dictates that in an automotive world, it's different because you buy a car, you keep it three, four, five years, then you get another car. And, you know, it's not like you're driving. It's not like you're staying in 50 hotels, you know, your, your, your access to vehicles and experiencing different vehicles is very limited. So I think it's a slightly different dynamic. It's not a restaurant. It's not a hotel. Yeah. And having a genuinely authoritative view is 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 based on experience of all the other vehicles. So, you know, we have consumer reviews on our site, and they're hugely valuable because it's giving people, you know, a, an opinion on what it's been like to live with and people's experience and everything else. And it's a really valuable part of what we do. 
but it's hard to like offer a genuine opinion on a vehicle if you haven't driven you know all the other cars in the class and haven't driven them in you know a sort of apples to apples environment and that i think is still a key differentiator of the automotive space because it's all about you know have you got access to the vehicles and then if you've got access to the vehicles you know have you got access to you know to to using them and testing them in a in a familiar way and and that's all and throughout my career that's always been the the challenge that you need to get into the vehicles and you need to build up as an organization the experience and the reference point and also as an individual so here's a, here's a question for the listeners or anybody watching on youtube do you guys and gals still test drive vehicles is the test drive dead now let me explain that because now we we live in a world where it's acceptable to go online to something like a bring a trailer or even a gooding or an rm in the collector car world there's a specialty world and people are spending thousands of dollars if not millions of dollars on cars that are sight unseen now i get it if you're gooding and you've got a ferrari 250 lm you know you're not really buying it to drive it you know and if you do it's monterey or whatever you know a uh, car week but you're buying you're you're buying a, a used 911 or or a bmw m3 or you know even a, a mustang or or something like that uh off of a site like a bring a trailer or something. Um, and we're, we're, we're relying on those photos, the videos, the comments from, from the other people that may have owned the car or familiar with the car, the Carfax report is, is the test drive dead. Now that was mostly the used cars, but on new cars, do you get enough information as a consumer? So I'm talking to the audience. Uh, do you guys get enough information from the videos, the write-ups, the user reviews, the information from the manufacturer, from an admins.com. Do you get enough information there, especially in the videos, that you're like, I'm just going to order the car, right? Because that's kind of the new thing too, right? It's just order what you want. And that's how you avoid your markup. If you can get the order, you, you make the order and you, and then when it comes in, you go and you get your car. Is the yeah. is the is the test drive done? And to a certain extent, you know, the the sort of hands on dealer exp experience. I mean, we, you know, Edmunds has you know millions of vehicles as are on inventory or on the used and used and new side. And the way that works is you submit a lead and then you you know you liaise with the dealer. But that's still a different experience necessarily to go and going and just you know touring. 50 different car lots and that's why we exist right makes it easier you go online you can say i want a gray two-year-old honda civic and we will surface all of those in a you know within a radius of your choosing yeah and then it's dead easy to to go through the web all right i'll have that gray one in thousand oaks and you know you click through you submit your details you get hooked up with the dealer and it's it's actually a pretty you know it's a very simple process and we can do cash offers on your existing car and that's why we exist and of course you know, none of this existed 25 years ago, or certainly not in the form it is. So, so yeah, is there is there real advantage in going down and seeing the vehicle? I mean, maybe you know the only things I think really are that significant now is you know if you want to just feel like you know you fit in the back seat, the stroller, you know, the stroller fits in the trunk, and you know, does a 10 minute test drive really tell you that tell you that much? Um, I mean, I don't know. You guys cover all of that in videos and reviews anyway. You, yeah, you're you're, yeah, you're testing exactly. the stroller. You're testing the car seat. You're, you know, now now especially because you got kids, you keep jamming your kids into the back of cars to see if they fit. Exactly. <laughs> Electric they, Rolls they, Royce and everything else. They seem to enjoy it. <laughs> I think that the, the and if you look at the data, and obviously Edmunds these days is owned by Carmax, and you know Carmax has invested very heavily in recent years in basically you know in online resource so that people can you know complete a transaction online and now you know vast majority of people who deal with you know carbax are you know completing part of that journey online whether it's a bit of research whether it's looking for inventory whether it's you know looking at financial options all that sort of stuff you're doing at least some of the journey online because you know you'd, it, it saves time and effort if you're just going down to kick the tires at the you know at, at the local store so 
you know, it's changing what continues to change. And you're quite right. This is not just about people buying, you know, budget cars. It goes all the way through to, you know, some of the auction sites that, you know, you and I enjoy, you know, chewing the fat over that that can be millions of bucks. Because the reality is like, yeah. It's it's so, new and used cars. Does does the car dealer that we know today change? Does it become a place where they don't really sell you a car? You're you're buying your car new or used, essentially online. You're picking it. You're buying it online. The dealer simply becomes a place to pick it up or have delivered to you, and then it becomes a place for maintenance and maybe some aftermarket stuff. But it's not really. Like the idea of the car salesman just like driving up to the dealer lot and having the the two, three guys standing outside going, you know, can I help you? Can I help you? Can I get you into this? Like, do they do they need to have the fleet of new cars there on the lot? Or is that going to slowly disappear and just go, this is where we well, we take care of you. You ordered your car. You went online. You, 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 you ordered a new Lincoln or your new Tesla and it's going to be delivered to you. You either go to a location or they just bring you the car and that's that's it. And yeah, then you go I, to if, a, a dealer for I don't know for maintenance and you know recalls or whatever. One of one of the guys in, in the office was telling me he bought a new Tesla and it it basically got a note that said it's like sat outside your house. Yeah. And, and that he had a you know, he I think he I think he clicked on the app, the car opened up and literally that was it. I think the the person who dropped it off Ubered back to Tesla. Yeah. And you know, you've got no physical interaction at all and here is your you know fifty thousand dollar new toy um I, I, so it, it's changing it, honestly it was it was just a, a handful of years ago where even the press cars that were delivered the two guys would show up you know one in a yeah. you know, delivering you the car and the other guys giving them the ride home now they don't do that they just they just uber back that's it it's just all the guy yeah. shows up and then he just stands out there with his clipboard and and he's like, all right, enjoy your car. And he stands out there for five minutes till his car shows up, his Uber shows up, and then he <laughs> and then he leaves. Like it, it it's all about choice. I think the big thing is any company, we're no different, car mics are different, is it's all about choice, isn't it? Some people want to go and kick tires and you know, it becomes a thing. You know, they want to go and talk to people on the lot about, you know, is this good, is that bad? You know, but it's like clothes. Like nobody was going to buy clothes on online because clothes is a personal thing that you got to try. But then somebody had the bright idea, you know, saying, "Oh well, if you don't like it, send it back." It's like, "Oh, all right." And then of course everybody, you know, when was the last time you went into a store and like, you know, oh, I'm going to go shopping for clothes? Well, I don't know. I haven't for years. Yeah, it's it's an interesting thing. It's like, how many people? go to something like target to shop versus how many people just go to target to return stuff that they bought online from target online just to, you know, to see if it fits or whatever, or, or, you know, did, didn't like, or needed a swap for a different but, size or something like that. I don't, it's just, yeah, it's, just it's the same like, with cars, right? It's all this like, well, if you don't like it, do the test drive, you can bring it back within X number of days. Um, That's all. That's become a big part of the, you know, been a big part of the proposition. So as a consumer, it's just got a lot more. I think it's just got life's just got a lot more easy. You know, you know, and then for for like what you guys are doing specifically at Edmonds, there's going to be more of an evolution. Like we're so focused on videos because those are doing so well, and people enjoy seeing them, hear it, and instead of just the photos, it's like we can kind of see what's happening in in real time. Um, on a vehicle test or just like you said fitting a car seat in there but there's going to end up being future technologies more interactive ways of of looking at that car and getting a, a better sense of what that car is virtually before you even get to a dealer there's going to be some sort of virtual test drive if you will even before uh as we become more accustomed to just buying the vehicles, like it's just weird to see that so many people can just buy a car sight unseen. Um, and, and, and that's it. You just like, Hey, I just, I was on YouTube. I was on a bunch of websites. I, I compared features. I found stuff, read some reviews and I'm down to this SUV. I'm, you know, whatever you're down to your, you know, RAV four versus Honda. And, and, and I decided rav4 and i reached out to a couple of dealers or whatever and hit it online and bought it ordered it got what i wanted and 
And and when I get there, it's going to have, you know, PPF on it and everything, the options that I already wanted. And I'm just going to show up and get it and leave. Or it's going to come to me. Like you said, it's just going to show up in your driveway or out in front yeah. of your house. It's kind of, I don't know, it's kind of a interesting way of doing things. Before the pandemic lockdown, I spoke to the guys at Gooding Auction and very high-end cars. Uh and they never really thought too much about doing an online thing. I mean, it was always there and they've had discussions about it, but it wasn't really forced because their in-person auctions were still doing so well. And then, you know, we got locked down and they started their, their geared online auctions and they did very well. And now people are spending millions of dollars without ever even going to an auction. They still do some in-person auctions, which I enjoy going to. But yeah, now there's, it's a, it's a huge business. It's a huge business. Yeah. And, and it's changed the business. So it's not, I remember doing some work with RM that got bought out by, by Sotheby's and those events, they were an event, but also then every, your business was focused on, oh, in March, we're going to be in Monaco in June. We're going to be in London in, you know, August, we're going to be in Monterey. And it was just, it was like a calendar of social events and you, you know, you, you turned up to two or three and as you know, it's like the same people. <laughs> Uh, but as a business, yeah. that's quite hard to run. Whereas if you can sell them all online, and you know what's really the difference if you've got like 150 photographs on some website, and then a, as you like a bunch of people commenting on it, and the owner asking questions, and you've got some sort of buyer protection. Well, actually, you know, I bought my classic 911, and I don't, you know, I went down there and I kind of looked at it, and I thought this looks very nice, and I took it for a test drive and say, oh, it seems okay, but. Did I really know what I was looking at? I mean, I'd owned one before, so I had probably more sense than most, but like, I don't know. I'm not a, yeah. you know. Okay, but that's an example of like, you had one before, you were kind of, you were familiar with the car. You knew what you were getting into. I just drove the 2024 Mustang Dark Horse. And I, I've i driven a few of, of the cars, but if I was going to buy that car and order it online, which people are doing, I drove it with the automatic transmission and the Recaro seats. Now, I it's not so different from like my Mustang Mach 1 or the other Mustangs that have been out in the past few years. Uh, but I bought my Mustang Mach 1 and I didn't get the Recaro seats. I didn't think the Recaro seats were comfortable to me. Uh, they kind of push my shoulders forward. They kind of jam me under my, on my sides. And I wanted the the regular seat and I wanted the heated and cooling features and I wanted a power seat. And I was like, you know, for the Mach one, I was like, if I wanted to take it to the track, I can easily put a race seat in it. But if I didn't want to drive in the race seat, good luck trying to retrofit power heated and cooled seats into a, a, the, the car. You won't have the switches. You don't have the wiring harness. You don't have any of that. So again, in, in my, in my head, you think, Oh, I'm going to order this car up with all of the options. I'm going to get a new dark horse. Uh, and if they delivered it, I would have been unhappy after a week with the Recaro seats. Not that they're bad. They're just not good for me. Uh, yeah. And, th and then what do you do? Do you have to go back to the dealer and go, I, I don't, I don't like the Recaro seats. And they go, well, we could sell you other seats or we can swap them out. Or do we send the car back? And you know, cause it was spec'd out that way. It's like, how do you make the adjustment now there's going to have to be some way in the future if the conventional way of selling cars on the dealership floor and doing the test drive it's if that's going to go away completely there needs to be some sort of i don't know 14 day return policy or a way to even swap out options you know i i mean a little tougher if you're like it's not the shade of blue i thought i wanted so repaint it no you're yeah. you're, you're swapping for a different car but if it's like, hey, I wanted the 22-inch wheels on my truck and now it rides terribly, I should have gone with the 20s. You know, can you be, can the dealer be like, you got it. You you had you had 30 days to change your mind. We're just going to take your truck back. We're going to swap it with the 20-inch wheels instead of the 22s and we'll have it back to you in a couple of hours. Like is that going to happen in the future? I don't know. Well, I, I mean my view is we're, we're a long way from you know, what we're seeing in the market at the moment is actually dealers consolidating. So you're seeing less sort of mum and pop dealers, a lot more 
you know, huge conglomerates. And I was at the NADA Dealer Association show last week and, you know, it's still an enormous event, like 5,000 car dealers hitting Vegas. And so I think we're still, you know, we've seen people come in and do, you know, obviously Tesla's the prime example of direct to market stuff and more of a retail experience. But for anybody who's established, you know, the the the, the opportunity to do that is, is is simply not there from a legal perspective. So I think we'll still have a dealer model for decades to come. I, I just can't see I can't see how you kind of unpick 120 years of doing business. It's just not going to happen. Well, legally, it's not going to happen. It, it, right. Not because it's the better way. I'm not saying it's worse. I'm just saying we don't know that it's the better way. But the dealer association is going, this is how we do business. This is how we make money. We're not looking to change it. We don't want to make a change that's going to cut into how we make money. Obviously, they don't want to do that. Um, and for yeah. them, for sure, it makes sense. But from the consumer buying the car, what is going to be the best way to buy a car? I mean, and, I think and, what's going to happen. Yeah, it was going to happen is dealers will have to. Dealers will end up, as they already are, just offering a range of different, you know, ways of buying. And I mean, I did when we got at least our Genesis GV60 as the as the family car. Um, you know, I did most of the negotiation by text because you know trying to get a hold of me during the day is really difficult. Yeah, because I'm in our meetings, and you know, I was so I was just texting backwards and forwards, uh, I, and that for me, you know, I, and then you go into the dealer and you actually see all the conversation. It's just like duh, duh, duh. so all the negotiation basically was done by text, and it was like all right. All right, we got a deal, and then we just went in and signed a bunch of paperwork. I uh, I know a guy works in Hollywood, and he does he does a weird thing, and it's really kind of funny. Um, and and he's he's done it successfully. He finds a car that he wants, like we said, does all of his shopping online. He'll spec it out, and then he'll email like three or four dealers, and they'll all be copied on the single email. And he said, "Hi." This is my name. I'm ready to buy a car, cash in hand. This is what I want. It looks like each of you dealers has this. If you have a different color, I'm I'm open, right? But this is the options. This is what I want. Everybody submit me your best price and you must include everybody else on the email, right? So I've copied you all, full transparency. You must include everybody on the email. And uh, for the person who does follow the rules, and comes up with the best price, I will be there to buy the car. And you, you know, with you, the salesperson, I will meet with mm. you. You get your commission. He's done it again. Now, he usually like leases the car basically, you know, through his business or something. But every three years, he's done it for the for as long as I've known him. And so he's gotten a deal. He's just got it done. Whatever he's going to get. And somebody follows the rules or two people follow the rules. And he goes, thank you too. You know, I, I, I sent it to four of you guys, two of you guys did it. You gave me the best price. I, I'll, but, I'll, but Jack, I'll see you on Friday to buy the car. <laughs> but that's also like exactly what we do on our used car appraisal product. Yeah, you guys automate it now. Yeah. We automate it. So you can go on Edmunds now. You can, you can, we, you know, when you make a cash off, you can actually see different offers. So, or, or see, or see who's giving you the best offer. So there's a whole, yeah, what we're doing is effectively automating a lot of that experience because yeah. how do you, you know, how do you deliver value to the consumer? And so that applies not only when you're trading your vehicle in, but then also when you're, you know, when you're buying the vehicle, it's uh you know, it's a uh, it it it's it it's it swings around like Comax has the you know, Comax decided that this whole, you know, barter system or you know, constantly trying to negotiate People didn't want that and built a fantastically successful business off no haggle pricing. Like, yeah, this is the price. You know, Tesla does no haggle pricing, basically. And then everybody else, you know, it's more of a traditional model of negotiating your way through it. Now, whether you use a tool like Edmunds or whether you use, you know, whether you say you're doing it more manually, you know, the, the options are there. But it's, um, yeah, it's an interesting journey. Yeah. All right. Anyway, uh, for those of you guys listening, I'm just curious what your thoughts are on uh on the the car buying process new or used what are you guys doing yeah and does the and maybe what we matter? should do maybe we should do a q a on this matt because you know uh, we can bring in other people from the company if needs be and we could have a look at the yeah. whole like you know car buying process how we we have a 
you know, a few people on the team who are real experts in much more than me in like the actual, you know, mechanics of buying and shopping. Uh, and maybe we bring, you know, we have Ron Montoya on my, my, my team who, who's a super expert in this stuff. And, you know, we bring other people onto the show and we can answer all your questions. Uh, and speaking of that, um, Alistair and I want to answer uh, your your questions in general about anything that we're doing here on the podcast or what you want to see. Um, uh, feel free to email us at carcastshow at gmail.com. It's carcastshow at gmail.com. Send us an email with whatever, whatever questions you have about anything that we're doing, the cars we have, the stuff we're doing. Uh, we will uh, we'll try to get to some of your questions on, on the show. So. Um, yeah, we didn't get a chance to do that in the past, but uh, we're, we're we're up and running with the email. And you can oh, hit us up hit on us social media, social yeah. social media as well. Yeah, I'm just we run cars, your moderator. Yeah, uh, you can you can send us a DM and stuff, and we'll we'll gather some of those questions as well. I'd love to hear from you guys. Um, yeah, I guess we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up for now. So we'll wait for some uh, questions for maybe next week or or whenever. But um, unless there's an earthquake. Yeah, unless there's another earthquake. I uh, appreciate you guys listening. Go to Edmunds.com, uh, as uh, Alistair said, for all of your shopping needs and reviews and videos. And uh, give us a follow on, on social media, and we'll link to all the accounts and on, on the YouTube uh, channel as well. And again, as a reminder, these uh, podcasts are now up on YouTube. Um, so you I keep forgetting as I was like swinging on my it. mug halfway through. Yeah, uh, they're... Uh, they're up on YouTube as well. And we link to our social media accounts and stuff on there. So you can always go to YouTube to the car cash channel and find it there. Um, all right, guys. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time, keep the air in the spare and the bag of the wheel. For the latest updates and call-in times, follow the show on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at CarCast Show. If you'd like to write in, fill out the form on CarCastShow.com. And don't forget to give us a nice rating on iTunes. CarCast is a Corolla Digital production and is produced by Chris Loxamana. For more information, visit carcastshow.com. Carcast Show.